seminar. This week we have uh, Amanda Lace from the University of Michigan. Amanda got her bachelor's degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Illinois for plasma material interaction. Um, from there she went to another Big Ten school, University of Michigan, and is currently um, getting ready to defend her PhD in another month or so. Mm -hmm. um, working in Professor Kushner's group and, and uh, also in nuclear engineering. Um, and so and that's where we're at. So uh, uh, she's here visiting us today to give a talk on some of the work she's been doing at the University of Michigan. And despite the fact that you went to Illinois and Michigan, we were trying, we're, we, didn't, we, we weren't, we're trying to get ahead of the curve and uh, make sure that your daughter will be a fat fan. <laughs> 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 um, so uh, thank you very much for coming out today. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Amanda Leitz, and today I'll be discussing with you atmospheric pressure plasmas and talking about modeling their chemistry and flow. So I'll start out with an introduction to low temperature plasmas. I know some of you in the room know a lot about low temperature plasmas, but some of you may be a lot less familiar. Um, I'll talk about the models we've used to investigate these systems. And I'll talk about results from two different areas that I've looked at in plasma liquid interactions. I'll discuss plasma activation of droplets and aerosols. And in atmospheric pressure plasma jets, I'll discuss plasma induced flow instabilities as well as ionization wave propagation in atmospheric pressure plasma multi jets. So just before I get started, I want to acknowledge some of my collaborators uh, at the University of Michigan, my advisor, Mark Kushner, and colleague, Julius Kruzelnicki, and our experimental collaborators at the University of Orléans, Xavier Damini, Eric Robert, and Jean-Michel Pouvel. I'll be presenting some of their experimental results here. And also, I won't talk about this too much, but I did spend a semester at Sandia National Labs working with Ed Barnett. Um, to collect some data for model validation. And this work was funded primarily from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. So in case you're not familiar, uh, plasmas are the fourth state of matter. If you heat up a gas enough, it will become a plasma. And this field, uh, or plasmas are characterized by having a large enough charge species density that some collective behavior is exhibited. So this is not a single electron or a single ion moving in an electric field, but a uh, body of them which responds to applied electric and magnetic fields, often in a very dynamic or nonlinear way. Uh, and the field covers a huge range of parameter space over 20 orders of magnitude in density and roughly six orders of magnitude in temperature. And this varies from very high energy density systems like in uh, stellar plasmas as well as in experimental fusion devices and down to very low energy density, very diffuse plasmas, things like auroras um, and up in the ionosphere. But the plasmas I'm going to discuss today are low temperature plasmas. Um, so if you have two electrodes, you apply an electric field across the gap, and you generate some electron, either from a cosmic ray or by some surface process, you generate an initial electron. That electron's accelerated in the electric field, and it can gain enough energy to cause an ionization, which produces an additional electron. So this is called electron impact ionization, and it's what sustains most low temperature plasmas. So these new electrons then avalanche further uh, and produce a, a breakdown. And as a result, this plasma that's driven by electron impact ionization has an electron temperature which, which, which is much, much greater than the background gas temperature. So it's a highly non-equilibrium system. Some of the common examples of low temperature plasmas are in lighting, fluorescent light bulbs, neon signs. Um, but they're also used a great deal throughout industry, including in most steps of semiconductor processing, as well as uh, treating many surfaces of household products, things like scotch tape. So if you're not already uh, very interested in low temperature plasmas, I want to explain to you why they're important and why you might be. Um, so I've gone through the National Academy's list of grand challenges and just highlighted some of the areas where low temperature plasmas could help solve some of these grand challenges. So first in, in solar energy, 
Uh, low temperature plasmas have been used to produce nanoparticles, deposit silicon thin films, which can be useful for photovoltaics. Um, in providing access to clean water, uh, those have recently been shown to be able to remove particularly difficult to remove pollutants. So this could be for uh, water treatment for drinking water or for very specific streams of industrial waste. And also in providing energy from fusion. So fusion plasmas are typically very high energy density, but low temperature plasmas can form on the interface or on the edges of uh, magnetic confinement fusion devices. And that's where a lot of uh, important dynamics occur. In managing the nitrogen cycle for agriculture, uh, plasma catalysis has been of interest recently where we uh, synergistically combine low temperature plasmas with uh, standard catalysts to, uh, to produce some, some synergy that can more efficiently uh, fix nitrogen. And in carbon sequestration, uh, plasmas have been of interest for the dissociation of CO2 by uh, using uh, microwave or dielectric barrier discharge systems. So the applications I'll be talking about today are in a large part motivated by the field of plasma medicine. So in this field, at atmospheric pressure plasmas are used either to directly or indirectly treat tissue, and they've been shown to cause or induce healing of chronic diabetic wounds, uh, selectively kill cancer cells, uh, sterilize surfaces, um, as well as a number of desirable uh, outcomes in dentistry and dermatology and some other fields. The main mechanism by which the plasma interacts with the biological system is through the production of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, um, we sometimes call RONs. So these are things like hydroxyl radicals, oxygen atoms, and uh, in these systems, low temperatures, we need to have low temperature plasmas. So we don't want to burn people while we're treating them with this plasma source. Two of the most common plasma sources that fulfill this criteria are dielectric barrier discharges, which is this one here, and atmospheric pressure plasma jets. And in these cases, the tissue is typically not dry. It's covered in some biological liquid, so plasma-liquid interactions are also of interest here. So this is an example of a typical study in plasma medicine. A wound, two wounds are introduced to each mouse in this study, and an atmospheric pressure plasma jet is used to treat these, one of these wounds, and the other serves as the control. And they've calculated the delta S, the difference in area between the plasma-treated wound and the control wound. And for different treatment times, um, basically if you treat it for the right amount of time, if your dose is correct, the plasma-treated wound heals a lot faster than the one that's not plasma-treated. And uh, you can see that here on the pictures of the wounds as well. But something important to note is that these effects generally can't be attributed to a specific reactive species. Um, there's some species that we believe to be more important than others, but it's not a single species uh, that we need to optimize. There seems to be some interaction between multiple plasma-generated species. So I just want to explain a little bit about the plasma sources I'll be discussing. One is a dielectric barrier discharge. Um, so this is if we have two electrodes and apply a voltage across them and have a dielectric between these electrodes, so in this case two dielectrics, and a sinusoidal voltage is applied. When the electric field gets high enough, we get a breakdown, and this breakdown starts charging the surfaces of the dielectric, so it's filling that capacitance. And then once that charges up, the breakdown shuts off. And as the voltage falls back down, we get an electric field again across this gap. It breaks down again. Um, and as a result, we have a bunch of very brief, a series of very brief discharges um, that often last tens of nanoseconds, maybe hundreds of nanoseconds, but are typically pulsed at kilohertz frequencies. And this is something that keeps the gas heating to a minimum. So if we were just to turn a voltage on across this gap, we'd have significant gas heating um, and development of arcs and things like that. But we want to prevent that. Um, and adding this dielectric is one way to do it. Now, another type of plasma source, an atmospheric pressure plasma jet, is in a lot of ways a type of dielectric barrier discharge. Typically, it's a dielectric tube with helium flowing through the dielectric tube 
and um, sometimes argon as well. Uh, and a powered electrode, either wrapped around the outside, sometimes inside the plasma jet, and sometimes a ground electrode as well. And this helium flows out, mixes with the surrounding humid air. And when a high voltage is applied to the powered electrode, we begin to see a, a discharge that forms near, near it within the tube. And then this discharge propagates down and outside the tube. And this is uh, propagating as an ionization wave. So it's not moving, even though we have gas flow here, it's not moving with the gas flow velocity. It's moving much, much faster, um, using the same mechanisms that uh, lightning propagates with. So when we have a low temperature plasma in the presence of humid air, we get a lot of interesting chemistry that develops. And this is really important for the resulting biology. So we have energetic electrons that impact oxygen and water vapor and produce some initial reactive species that can then further react and form some more stable reactive oxygen species. So we group these as reactive oxygen species. And if you have nitrogen present in the system, you also get some reactive nitrogen species that tend to react with some of the reactive oxygen species and form uh, this complex mix of in containing a lot of acids, a lot of HNOx species as well. So uh, plasma liquid interactions are also uh, very important to applications. And this is because a liquid layer present on the tissue serves to process the reactive chemistry that's coming from the plasma source before it reaches the tissue below. And in many of these applications, um, the water behaves like a dielectric. So even though it can be conductive on the time scales of the plasma discharge, tens of nanoseconds, um, generally the conductivity is not as significant and we can sort of... And this is of interest in not only biomedical applications, but also agricultural applications, water treatment applications, uh, removing pollutants and things like that. Uh, the liquid adds complications to the chemistry. So we can also ad address the, the liquid phase chemistry uh, by accounting for the fact that both charged species, excited states, and reactive neutrals can solvate and undergo a complicated mix of chemistry in the liquid. So just to go over some of the results I'll be discussing today. Uh, first of all, in the area of plasma liquid interactions, I'll talk about plasma activated droplets and aerosols. And uh, this is both for indirect treatments for plasma medicine as well as more agricultural applications. And in atmospheric pressure plasma jets, I'll talk about plasma induced flow instabilities, which are like here, um, when you apply a plasma, sometimes the flow dynamics of the plasma jet change. And ionization waves in a device called a multi-jet, which is shown right here. It's a, a series of, it's a way to produce an array of atmospheric pressure, pressure plasma jets to treat larger surface areas. So the first model we've used to investigate this is called Globalkin. It's a zero-dimensional plasma chemistry and kinetics module uh, model that uh, includes options for volume averaged diffusion losses to the walls and volume averaged effects of gas flow as well. And my primary contribution to this model during my PhD has been to add the capability to address liquid chemistry um, fully coupled with the plasma chemistry in this model. So we treat this system as two well-stirred reactors, the plasma being one and the liquid being the other. And species can transit from one reactor to another across the interface. And we do that through uh, the volume average diffusion losses, which use a sticking coefficient. So the sticking coefficient is the loss probability when something hits the surface. And for charged species, we assume if they hit the surface, their sticking coefficient is 1. So charged species solvate in the liquid. Uh, but for neutral species, their sticking coefficient depends on um, their chemical properties as well as what the current density is in the liquid. Um, so we approximate their sticking coefficient using their Henry's law constant, this H value, which just says whether the species prefers to be in the gas phase or prefers to be in the liquid. In the liquid, we also address reactions as well as solvation, desolvation, and add the effects of evaporation in the gas. And though this is a well-stirred reactor 
um, approximation, so we're losing all spatial resolution. It can be very useful to address very uh, realistic long time scales, so things like thousands of pulses, many seconds or minutes of discharge dynamics and chemistry that uh, would be more difficult to uh, investigate in a more complex model. The second model I've used is called non-PDP SIM. Non-PDP SIM is a two-dimensional plasma hydrodynamics model. Uh, it solves Poisson's equation on an unstructured mesh and also includes options for uh, solving Navier-Stokes equations for the neutral flow as, as well as uh, radiation transport and some for surface chemistry. And just to highlight some of my contributions to non-PDP SIM, um, first to make the salvation model uh, a little bit more physical, more self-consistent. Also, I've tightened the coupling between the fluid dynamics and the plasma dynamics. Um, and this allows us to more accurately track the expansion that happens if you have localized gas heating in a plasma, which is something I'll talk about during the uh, flow instabilities discussion. And I've also, uh, increase the efficiency of the model by changing some of the approaches to how we solve Poisson's equation. So I want to highlight some of the uh, challenges with modeling a, modeling a low temperature plasma and to do that I've kind of compared it to fluid dynamics modeling and one of the important things to address is non-Maxwellian electron energy distribution functions. So in fluid dynamics, one of the assumptions that goes into uh, that approach is that the um, energy distribution functions are Maxwellian. Um, but in a low temperature plasma, it's often not the case for electrons. And this comes out of the, uh, the structure of the cross sections that exist for electron impact processes. So as electrons become more energetic on the order of uh, 0.1 eV, we start to see vibrational excitations occur in, in molecules. And then on the order of several eV, we see some attachment can occur if it's electronegative or uh, electronegative. The ionization potential of, of the species, then we get electron impact ionization. And along the way, we also have elastic uh, collisions occurring throughout. And so this is a uh, differs from uh, a purely fluid model in that um, to calculate reaction rates, uh, we need to address the full energy distribution function um, and convoluted with the cross section. And often those energy distribution functions, because of this structure, can be pretty non-Maxwellian. So the first area of results I'll talk about is droplets and air. So in plasma treatment of liquids, oftentimes a saturated surface layer occurs. So this is the density of a couple liquid species as they're being plasma treated. And we get this saturation layer um, that prevents the, the transport or slows the transport into the bulk liquid. And one way to overcome this is just to have small liquid droplets immersed in plasma. And you sort of just use surface area to volume to uh, overcome some of those transport limitations. And plasma treatment of droplets and aerosols is of interest for sterilizing large surface areas. So uh, maybe you activate droplets and spray them over a surface. Um, and also for uh, some commercially viable, potentially commercially viable production of hydrogen peroxide. So we're modeling this system in zero dimensions. Uh, so this is the two well stirred reactor approach. But the geometry we're using um, to provide us with all of our gas and liquid volumes and diffusion links is here. It's a ten, single 10 micron droplet in a basically a dielectric barrier discharge reactor. And we did a single droplet because uh, we want to kind of develop some of the fundamental scaling principles of this system. And we apply a, we impose a power pulse that looks something like what you would find in a DBD and uh, apply 500 pulses at 10 kilohertz and we look at the chemistry over 500 pulses plus uh, to five, nan or five seconds. 
The chemistry that occurs over the first several pulses, uh, we see that at every discharge, um, we have some electron impact dissociation reactions that occur and produce some oxygen atoms, some hydroxyl radicals, and these oxygen atoms often recombine in between uh, discharge pulses. But many of them build from pulse to pulse. These are things like ozone and hydrogen peroxide that are a little bit more stable. So this is in the gas phase, this is in the liquid. In the liquid, these curves are much more smooth because they're sort of moderated by diffusion, the diffusion time scales from the gas to the liquid surface. Um, so we get some hydrogen peroxide and ozone from pulse to pulse. And some of the reactive nitrogen species that are generated in the gas phase, they tend to have more smooth dynamics uh, from pulse to pulse. And this is because they take several steps to form. So they require reactions among many different reactive species and tend to solvate. And the acids will often dissociate in the liquid, causing some acidification of, uh, of the liquid droplet. But now we want to look at some of the, the scaling principles here. So I've compared two different droplet diameters. This is a one micron droplet and a one millimeter droplet. And for hydrogen peroxide and ozone. And I chose these species because they're fairly stable um, and have very different Henry's law constants. So hydrogen peroxide has a Henry's law constant of on the order of 10 to the six. And that means it very much prefers to be in the liquid phase. Ozone has a Henry's law constant of 0 0.3, so it uh, mostly prefers to be in the gas phase. And uh, this results in very different behavior between these two species. So hydrogen on the droplet diameter. And for they're basically independent of the droplet diameter. And this comes from the fact that basically all the hydrogen peroxide you produce in this reactor goes into the droplet if given enough time. And so if, with a larger droplet, you're just diluting that hydrogen peroxide density in a larger liquid volume. And we can see that if we look at the rest of the species with high Henry's law constant. So I've compared the densities at after five seconds. Um, these species all have high Henry's law constants and are very sensitive functions of the droplet diameter. Uh, this is a log scale, so sensitive functions of really the, the liquid volume in the system. Now for the species with low Henry's law constant, the most stable of these species are H2O and hydrogen gas. And they're independent of droplet diameter. Um, so there's these two different behaviors at the different uh, extremes of Henry's law, and they can give us some selectivity on what, uh, what we want. And several of these constant are sensitive to the droplet diameter, and that's because they typically originate from the decay of species with a high Henry's so they, they depend on the slow decay of peroxy nit nitric acid and peroxy nitrous acid. And now if we look at the, uh, the density of droplets in the reactor, so we take 10 micron droplets and just vary the number of droplets, um, we can see we get a local maximum in the density of most of the high Henry's law constant species. So this is because at low, uh, at a low number of droplets, you end up being transport limited. Basically the the droplets are very far apart, and it takes a long time to diffuse from the bulk plasma to the droplet surface. And uh, at large droplet diameter, if you, if you get too large, then you end, or I'm sorry, a large number of droplets, if you get too large, you end up diluting uh, the reactivity over a larger liquid volume. And so there's kind of this trade-off of um, optimizing transport versus uh, dilution. So just to kind of highlight why this study is important, um, there have been some, definitely some beneficial uh, aspects of plasma treatment of, in agriculture. So this is an apple, a plasma jet treating an apple. And this probably isn't the most efficient way to, eat, to treat all the produce that we eat every day. 
Um, so one of the proposed methods to uh, quantities in, of irregular surfaces is to use this plasma activated aerosol. So this is a, um, a setup used by some of our colleagues at Drexel uh, where they ran a, uh, an aerosol through a dielectric barrier discharge and activated it chemically and then uh, the activated droplets come into, in this case, a, a mini fridge filled with petri dishes, but this could also be uh, scaled up to something like a produce transit uh, truck or a storage facility. And that way they, they can treat large surface areas with a very small device. The next topic I'll discuss is atmospheric pressure plasma jets and plasma-induced flow instabilities in these jets. And this was recently uh, published in Applied Physics Letters. So plasma-induced flow instabilities have been observed experimentally uh, in, in these plasma jets, where basically if we don't have a plasma and we have a heli helium flowing through a plasma jet, this is some Schlieren imaging that shows that the flow is nice and laminar, pretty stable. Um, but then once the plasma is turned on, the flow becomes very unsteady. And there was a lot of speculation in the literature of why this may have occurred. Um, the, the, mecha the mechanisms proposed include uh, things like gas heating, ion wind, which is the momentum coupling from the charged species to the bulk fluid flow, as well as uh, some effects of the buoyancy of the helium, but not really a, uh, a specific mechanism hadn't really been proposed or validated. And we know this uh, plasma-induced flow instabilities is important. Um, these are OH radical density measurements in various flow conditions. And you can see as the flow conditions change, very clearly the reactive species that are generated change. We know that the reactive species are what's doing most of the work, um, so they need to be controlled and reproducible. So the geometry we've used to investigate this question is here. It's a cylindrically symmetric geometry. Um, and this is a quartz tube with a powered electrode, an annular powered electrode on the inside of the tube, and a grounded ring wrapped around the outside of the tube. And we flow helium through the tube with uh, some impurities present, kind of at the parts per million level, and apply a pressure boundary condition at the top, and we have humid air surrounding the, the jet. We calculate the fluid dynamics only for five milliseconds and let it come to the steady state before we apply the high voltage pulse and start calculating the plasma dynamics. The Reynolds number in this uh, case is 1400. When we apply a high voltage pulse, we see an ionization wave begin right at the powered electrode and it propagates out the end of the tube and then the plasma is focused on the region uh, at the interface between the helium and the diffusing in humid air. And this is where a lot of the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species are produced. And we also see the development of this hot spot right near the powered electrode. And as a result of that, we get some localized gas heating. So in this case, we're seeing gas heating of up to 600 Kelvin in, um, so a doubling of the gas temperature in about 70 nanoseconds. And so this is on the time scales of the plasma discharge. And then this is in a very small volume though. So the gas then expands in microsecond time scales after this. So what I've plotted here is the change in uh, number density of the gas. So just the density change. And this shows an acoustic wave that propagates out at the, the speed of sound in helium and eventually exits the tube and uh, propagates through this shear layer on uh, microsecond time scales. But then after about two microseconds, the highest gas temperature is already down to 350 Kelvin. So this is a brief, very localized gas heating. But now if we look at the changes in the bulk flow over the course of, of tens of microsecond time scales, these are the changes in x and y velocity and the changes in nitrogen density, which you can think of the change in nitrogen density just as a motion of the interface between the helium mixing with the humid air. And we see these, this structure develop, um, this wave develop on the interface right here. Uh, 
And this is a Kelvin Helmholtz instability or a shear instability uh, that develops and grows. So the perturbation from the acoustic wave um, causes this, uh, the growth of this. And if we turn off the gas heating in the model, then we can see that this, none of this happens. Uh, so we can attribute this flow instability back to this localized gas heating. So I've showed that the plasma can affect the fluid dynamics. Now I want to show that the fluid dynamics can affect the plasma. So this is a purposefully very uh, unsteady uh, initial flow condition. And we have an ionization wave that's propagating into it. And the ionization wave tends to remain in the regions of highest helium concentration. And this is because the electron energy losses are much more rapid in a molecular gas. We can excite vibrational and rotational modes. Um, and the electrons lose, lose energy rapidly to those low threshold energy modes. So, in plasma treatment uh, for biomedical applications, we really care in the end about the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species production. And we want the production of these species to be consistent and reproducible from uh, patient to patient. And these flow instabilities, which um, weren't well understood, can really affect that reproducibility. Um, so I've highlighted here in two different flow conditions the, some of the reactive, the changes in reactive species that are generated. Generally, if the flow conditions are unsteady, we get more reactive species generation because there's more contact between the plasma and the surrounding humid air. There's just more surface area for that contact. And understanding these dynamics so that we can prevent them or at least control them and predict them is uh, really important for reproducibility in plasma medicine. So the next project I'll discuss is ionization wave propagation in a multi-jet. So plasma jets are generally a very small area plasma source. They treat on the order of square millimeters of surface area at a time. And oftentimes it's desirable to treat a large area where they have a large wound or you want to activate the surface of a polymer um, for production. Of, uh, of an, indus an industrial product. And you may want to put these together in an array. But if you put them together, they interact in ways that are often very complex. So we've got the flow dynamics of each of these coming together. And they interact in those ways, as well as um, they often interact electrostatically. So as ionization waves propagate out each of these, they have a potential associated with them. And the electric field can disturb the neighboring ionization wave. And um, this, this makes arrays a little bit more complex. And uh, to kind of get around this or um, still produce a large array, our colleagues, our experimental colleagues uh, at University of Orléans have developed this multi-jet device. This is a dielectric tube with a bunch of holes drilled along one side of it. And basically, an ionization wave propagates inside this dielectric tube and then splits out each one of these holes. So we have a single initial ionization wave and several secondary ionization waves that form this array. And our objective here was to computationally investigate the fundamental properties of ionization waves in, uh, in this device. And part of that is because it was quite challenging for them to design this device and get all of the parameters correct, all the spacing between the, um, between the holes and flow rates and things like that to really achieve this uh, nice uniform geometry. So the computational geometry we've used for this is a dielectric tube, again, with helium flowing through it. And we have five holes drilled along the dielectric tube. And this, this tube is capped. And helium flows out, down, and a pressure boundary condition is applied at the bottom here. And we actually flow uh, humid air in between these holes. A ground electrode wrapped around the outside and a powered an annular to the tube. And we apply a 32 kilovolt pulse with a 5 nanosecond rise time. And there's a ground plane at the bottom, which would serve as the, the surface being treated, as well as some distant grounds around the outside. 
So there's a couple things we need to account for here, because I'm using a 2D code. And this, this is really, truly a 3D geometry. Um, so one of them is the presence of air around the device. So in 3D, you have helium flowing out through each of these holes. And you might entrain air sort of into and out of the page. And just in order to approximate that, we have airflow. We've applied an airflow between the holes. And uh, tuned this airflow so that our general flow structure uh, resembles what they've measured in the experiment by Schlieren imaging. And um, a couple other considerations in this model is we're using a positive polarity pulse, and these can be very sensitive to radiation transport. Um, so photoionization out ahead of the ionization wave can be very important for its propagation because the electrons are then accelerated back towards the ionization wave. And so we've included uh, radiation from the helium excimer uh, ionizing the components of humid air, as well as outside the tube, um, this photoionization mechanism also becomes important. So we've included that. So when we apply a high voltage, the, a primary ionization wave, what we're calling a primary ionization wave, propagates from left to right. And these vertical ionization waves that branch off, I'll call secondary ionization waves. And we already see some significant interaction between these different secondary ionization waves. So we sort of skip propagation in the second hole um, because of this electrostatic interaction between uh, the ionization waves. And this potential kind of gives you some idea of this, how this electrostatic interaction is happening, that as the ionization wave propagates, potentials change. And once you form a conductive channel, also you get kind of a restrike behavior um, where the conductive channel forms and the potential uh, evolves. So one of the most important uh, control parameters of this, these discharge dynamics is the voltage. Excuse me, the voltage polarity. Um, so we have positive polarity at the top and negative at the bottom, and the dynamics are completely different. In positive polarity, both in the experiment and the model, we have an ionization wave which actually reaches the the target surface, but in negative polarity, the ionization waves tend to die off right at the interface between the helium and the humid air. And this is because the electric field enhancement right at the head of the ionization wave is actually greater in the positive polarity ionization wave. Um, but it is also because of the structure that occurs near the powered electrode. So in for positive polarity, the plasma potential is basically uh, on the order of the applied voltage. And for negative polarity, there's a drop between the applied, the applied voltage and the, a cathode fall layer, which develops right at that uh, powered electrode. And we end up with a plasma potential that's actually lower, and we don't have as much of an electric field right at the ionization wavefront. Now, another one of the design parameters of this device is the gap between the, uh, the gap between the holes. And this affects the ionization wave propagation in two different ways. Just spreading them out means any electrostatic effects will be uh, more limited because they're farther apart. But in addition to that, they're also in, with larger gaps, these, ioniza these secondary ionization waves are more separated in time. So by the time the ionization wave reaches uh, the second hole, the first secondary ionization wave has already contacted the surface. And that helps to diminish some of the interactions. And this is the electron density at the end of the, the plasma period um, for these different, uh, these different conditions. And increasing this gap gets us a lot more ionization waves that propagate and actually reach the surface. Now if we look at the effect of the hole diameter, we see we have 200 micron holes here and 800 micron holes here. And we see a lot more delay from the time that the positive ionization or the primary ionization wave passes until the secondary ionization wave actually emerges from the tube for a smaller diameter case. Whereas in large diameter, um, it basically just propagates straight through this hole. And we wanted to explain why this was. Um, and one of the most important uh, aspects of this is the photoionization view angle. So 
in a very small hole, we have this small or this large aspect ratio. And basically, the view angle from out here in the air to the bulk plasma for radiation transport is very small. Um, so there's only a, a narrow view angle for these photons to escape. And as a result, the photoionization is low outside the tube. And these uh, photoionization reactions provide ionization right ahead of the ionization wave that really keeps it going. And in the case of a larger diameter, we get more photoionization, and this secondary ionization wave isn't as delayed. Now if we look at the to the grounded surface, um, we see that this is a little bit of a, this parameter provides a little bit of a trade-off. If we have a very close grounded surface, um, we get ionization wave propagation out all of the holes, but it tends to kind of attenuate from one hole to the next. And this is because uh, once you form a conductive channel at the first hole, um, there's very little, uh, resistance along that channel um, because there's not much air that's diffused in here. It's, it's mostly helium. Um, but if you increase this gap, we get more diffused in air. There's a little bit more resistivity there. And uh, we can get a more uniform propagation that doesn't fade quite as much from one hole to the next. But then if you increase it further, we start to see more of the effects of this interaction, this electrostatic interaction between the secondary ionization waves. And further increase this gap, and they don't reach the surface at all because there's not a high enough electric field. So atmospheric pressure plasmas are desirable for plasma medicine because they provide control over the gas composition compared to a dielectric barrier discharge where you're just operating in humid air. So there's some advantages there, but a lot of, oftentimes, the very small treatment areas can limit the applications um, to areas where those small treatments are okay. And this multi-jet could be used to treat both large by large tissue surfaces, larger tissue surfaces, as well as um, in more industrial applications like the activation of surface or of surfaces. And we've shown here the ways that um, some of the design parameters of this device can be tuned um, to better design this device for more uniformity. So things I've worked on. I just wanted to highlight um, some of the other projects that I didn't get to discuss today, um, just in case you want to discuss it more. Um, in the area of plasma liquid interaction, also used the 0D model to look at long time scale chemistry in liquid covered tissue. And in the area of atmospheric pressure plasma jets, I've looked at the effects of different electrode configurations, um, as well as the effects of impurities and molecular admixtures in atmospheric pressure plasma jets. And uh, I've also done a little bit of experimental work. Um, that's a jet I built there. And uh, in, in order to provide some data for validation of this modeling, um, looking at different shroud gases, operational parameters like applied voltage and flow rates, and also comparing the interactions uh, with liquid surfaces and with titania, which is a liquid with a similar dielectric constant. And so with that, I'll just close with a couple comments that I think computational modeling of low temperature plasmas can provide some really valuable insights on both the, the chemical kinetics as well as um, some of the important dynamics that occur and control this plasma behavior. Uh, global models can be very useful to study the general scaling laws of plasma activated liquids. And, uh, can affect uh, localized brief time scale gas heating. And we could use similar techniques to investigate many applications of low temperature plasmas in areas like uh, agriculture, even like nanoparticle production or water treatment. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. multi-jet. Were you able to um, validate any of that with um, you know, the experiment that you were on? Um, yeah, so I, 
I only showed one comparison here of the, so these are ICCD images from the experiment. So I only showed one direct comparison here, but um, we actually have experimental evidence for a lot of what I've talked about. Um, we, they did take some electric field measurements around these devices um, using a, a probe, and that gave us a little bit more quantitative comparison. Um, generally, the, we've captured most of the dynamics pretty well. We're overestimating, there's a couple things that we can't do well here because we're approximating this as two dimensions and it really is 3D. And so the voltages here are different. And that's not a surprise because of this assumption of 2D. So when I have an ionization wave that's propagating across here, I'm really treating it like a sheet, um, an infinite, infinite depth sheet that's propagating in this direction. But um, in reality, this is, you know, more like a, uh, a rod that's propagating. And that means that the field, the electric field enhancement right at the edge of that is much higher in three dimensions than it would be in two dimensions. And kind of historically, uh, if you compare that with axisymmetric simulations and things like that, if you double the voltage, you get about the same ionization rates at the ionization wave front. Um, but it also means that we, uh, we're also overestimating some of the interactions that occur um, between these secondary ionization waves. So they see the interactions, um, but they see it at closer distances than we would in the model. Um, so it's not perfect, but it gives us a lot of uh, information on some of the qualitative controlling behavior. Um, so it's, it's a surface ionization wave that's developing, um, and they see some indication of this in the experiment. You really can't see it very well in these images, um, but they do see a little bit of a hot spot down there, um, and that's, that's to be expected in the positive polarity case, because that's where the cathode ball is. Um, so th there is uh, some, some physics there of the surface ionization wave spreading. Mm. No. Um, so in this case, it's, it's very simple because we've done it as 0D. So all I really provide is uh, a liquid volume, um, okay. effectively. We, we account for diffusion in the gas phase using a diffusion length, just kind of based on the average distance between droplets, or the average distance between surfaces in the reactor. Um, so in some ways, in a lot of ways, that's, that's a lot of approximations. Um, but uh, in the paper, which I didn't talk about, uh, we also compare these results with um, some two-dimensional modeling, which was done by uh, my colleague. And we can show that how, how the global model has some advantages because we're actually assuming that the liquid is well stirred, where in the 2D model that we have, we don't track uh, liquid convection. Um, so th there's some advantages and disadvantages both ways, um, but we can't. Uh, capture really the two-phase flow dynamics that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So can we change this optimum one centimeter gap by changing the whole size or any other parameter? Um, yeah, definitely. So um, there's this, uh, it, it's, it's all a trade-off, and these are kind of tuning parameters to give you tools of, oh, we have interactions between it, between the secondary ionization waves, so maybe we need to uh, bring it closer together, or some other things you can do are increasing the, uh, the flow rates. And um, like I said, these, um, we're overestimating the interaction between these, um, so that one centimeter is not a quantitative uh, prediction, it's a qualitative prediction that there would be some, some optimum in between, but in reality, it's probably a little further away. Mm. 
Yeah, so the um, Henry's Law Constants, um, a lot of that comes from the literature on like atmospheric aerosols. Um, so they're actually pretty good for things like NO and NOx and um, even nitrogen atoms or OH because those are things that are of interest in the upper atmosphere um, where you know cloud dynamics are occurring and um, so a lot of those have been measured and actually a lot of um, Henry's Law for pollutants have been measured because a lot of those studies are concerned about pollutants as well. Um, the, the things that we're more concerned about are where Henry's Law sort of falls apart. So in um, very reactive species, um, also in species that are surfactant, so they really reside on the surface, we don't resolve that because we have two reactors, we don't have the interface in between them in this model. Um, and so if you were looking at a surfactant species, you'd be really interested in that. So um, we're much more concerned about not species that don't have Henry's Law constants, but species where Henry's Law constant isn't valid anymore. Um, can you go back to the slide with the turbulence model? Oops. Oops. I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Do you want this or the model description? Yeah, this is, I've been reading that you can actually um, have a laminar flow and induce your own turbulence uh, to improve the mixing of you know, Um, you mean in plasma systems or? Yes. Uh, sorry, can you be more specific or elaborate? Um, like either with chlorocrona. Okay. Um, so using a plasma to, on purpose, induce turbulence? Yeah, so I mean, it certainly, I think we've shown that it certainly can happen. It's, it's reasonable. Um, and I think a lot of uh, what you'll see is in um, kind of flow attachment studies where, um, or flow control studies where in aerospace applications they uh, use plasmas, often DVDs or localized discharges to um, basically provide very localized gas heating and change uh, the attachment on an airfoil and things like that. I don't know if that's what you meant, but. <laughs> oh, they told me and I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can find out for you if you'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's please thank our speaker. Thank you very much. See everyone next week. Oh, you probably need to pause the. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs>